you want to put yeah, take a chair. <laughs> take a chair. Take a chair and sit down. Please be seated. Your Excellencies, in particular, Mrs. Mukherjee, Ambassador of India to the Netherlands, and Mr. Kular, Ambassador of India to the Euro European Union, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Colleagues from Erasmus University and from our sister universities in the Netherlands and abroad, good afternoon and welcome to this academic ceremony. Welcome to the International Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University, Rotterdam. This afternoon, Professor Ashwini Said will deliver his valedictory address and with this will officially, I repeat officially, retire as Professor of Rural Economics. Warm welcome to you, Ashwani Said. Of course, a special welcome to your wife, Dr. Rika Wazir, and of course, I welcome your close friends here present today. Thank you for joining us. Students and staff of ISS, welcome to you. Of course, everyone has switched off, not the mobile telephone, but the ringtone, and then I encourage you to, uh, to report to the outside world through the social media how thrilling ISS is. <laughs> Only for that reason. Ashwani Said did his MA in Economics at St. Stephen's College and Delhi School of Economics at Delhi University. Subsequently, he did his PhD at Trinity College and the Faculty of Economics and Politics of the University of Cambridge in the UK. He defended his PhD thesis on agrarian structure and marketed surplus in the Indian economy already in 1978. Apart from ISS, Ashwani Said was staff member at the Delhi School of Economics, at the Faculty of Economics and Politics of Cambridge University, he was a research fellow at Queen Elizabeth House in Oxford. He was the first holder of the Chair of Development Studies and Director of Development Institute at the London School of Economics. Moreover, he held and holds visiting and honorary professorships at the Center for Development Studies in Kerala, the Institute of Human Development in New Delhi, the Institute of Development Studies in Kolkata. But of course, we know Ashwini Said best as Professor of Rural Economics here at ISS since 1981. Over the years, apart from that, he has done a lot for ISS in various management positions. He served as Deputy Rector uh, from 91 to 93 and as Dean of Studies in 2005 and 2006. If you have a closer look at Professor Said's academic work, Professor of Political Economy of Development would perhaps have been a more appropriate title than Professor of Rural Economics. Of course, he worked on 
agricultural and rural issues on agrarian change, rural industrialization, but also on internal and international migration, on economic and social impacts of ICT, on MDGs, employment, decent work, inequality, Chinese transformations. He is closely working together with the Self-Employed Women's Association in India on women's empowerment in the informal economy. And last but not least, together with his wife, Dr. Wazir, on the elimination of child labor. Professor Said, I would like to invite you to, uh, to take my place in order to deliver your inaugural address on, in on inequality, a counter-hegemonic argument. Did I sit? I said inaugural. <laughs> Shall I keep it that way? <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> I'm reminded that Kurt Martin, one of honorary fellows, actually joined the institute after he retired at the age of 65 <laughs> and stayed on for another 20 years. <laughs> so thank you for the invitation, <laughs> Rector. Um, so dear Rector, uh, Rector's past, who are so well represented here that I'm made a little anxious. Um, colleagues, past and present, your Excellencies, it's an honor to um, you do me by your presence. Uh, students past and present, colleagues, friends. It's nice of you to be here. Uh, it was Confucius who said something which uh, I thought was wise. He normally said those sorts of things. He said, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. <laughs> and so it has been for me. Um, a life of work with no sense of alienation, with blurred boundaries between work, leisure, and pleasure, something pointed out very regularly by my wife, not with a smile. And I think it was 43 years ago, um, on a wintry, dusky evening, that I gave my first formal lecture to the MA in Economics on Indian Planning Models at the Delhi School of Economics. And my passage through economics has been a charmed one. I've been very fortunate. Um, Delhi School of Economics had a galaxy of economists. Any name that you care to mention in the longest of lists was either there or passing through. And it was my privilege to be a student. And I know that uh, both ambassadors who were present here were at that time, also passing through Delhi University, and they're fully aware of, of the privilege we had, and I think many others in the audience also would know this. And from there, I passed on, quite by accident. Life is a series of accidents, points joined by lines. And it took me to Cambridge, uh, where again, there was a pantheon of the greats. And I'm again delighted to see one representative, at least from there, in the, in the audience, in the person of Michael. Um, those were the days of its maturity, of its classical heterodoxy. It was a great place. Um, I, I, th I would just like to mention that there are three or four aspects which, uh, as an economist, as my journey through economics, were quite important. First was um, economics, I think somebody says, is, is concentrated politics. I think it was Lenin who said that. Uh, but it was also concentrated politics in the faculties, in the seminar rooms, not just out in the streets. And so intra, the, the intra-economics, the interdisciplinary aspect of, of struggle in economics was very profound. This was there both at the Delhi School of Economics, but much more so when you went, went to Cambridge, where it was very, very profound. A second, inter, in, a second intellectual struggle, I think quite an important one, was the inter interdisciplinary struggle. And I think that was missing for most who were economists, whether they went through all the best institutions, but it was meant to be the queen of disciplines. And it had supreme arrogance because um, it was matched only, its arrogance was matched only by its ignorance uh, of the other disciplines. And I think its insensitivity towards those. 
um, turning mathematical uh, more and more without really uh, knowing why. I'm reminded of Joan Robinson's aphorism. Uh, she said, well, you know, I, I, couldn't, I didn't do maths, so I had to think instead. Um, and I, I, I think they've been, but the interdisciplinary aspect was very important, and I, I don't think that really, um, I was preparing for that. I'd been put through um, going to a, to a village by K. N. Raj at the Delhi School of Economics. I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot from going to the Bihar famine and wandering around there from lots of uh, hill walking and mountaineering and so on, living in, in with people for months, um, and of course going to China for a very long period of time. And then later on, as the lecturers mentioned, with, with SEVA and also with the MV Foundation. Um, so there's a lot to learn there, and this was a third. But I think another struggle I want to mention, which is typical for, for an Indian, is, is a, what I'd call a large, uh, large country syndrome. We know that from foreign trade, but I can tell you it also applies in, in thinking in social science. If you say something comparative, an Indian or a Chinese or an American will think interprovincial, interstate, but not intercountry. Um, and I think this very much applied to me. So you can imagine uh, what all I benefited and what I got from the Institute. I got into dis disciplinarity. Uh, I got a sense of the international aspect of comparative development. I think both of these are profound. And of course, I came to a congenial home, uh, which a, an institution which had located and positioned itself uh, very consciously uh, in uh, what you would call counter-hegemonic space at that point in time. There may have been changes since then, but it's always a, a struggle. Now, this economics and sociology, I just want to say one other thing about it. It was in, De in, in Delhi, never, the two never met economics and sociology. They had different buildings, they had different professors, they were at war with each other. One had the Pope as uh, Professor Srinivas, the other had the Cardinal as Professor Srinivas' son, and never the twain would meet, except that economists were all boys, and sociologists were all girls, and they would meet in the coffee house. <laughs> and that's where the twain met. And I, I think uh, many a profitable partnership was struck there. Economists were from Mars, and they looked like Martians, and they behaved like Martians. But I'm delighted to say that these sociologists were genuinely from Venus, and they looked like Venus too. So my dear wife, also I was a sociologist from that time, I met as part of that. And I see here also another combination in the person of uh, the ambassador and Dr. Uh, Kudar, who also are, represent this kind of a partnership. So I think I'd, I'd like to stop with, uh, with these uh, remarks, I except to say that I, this is the time also for Thanksgiving. And I would like to uh, say thanks to all my teachers. And there have been so many that I cannot even think of them. Uh, those teachers include your peers, they include your students, uh, above all. Uh, one of my oldest, most respected uh, teachers said that you don't start learning till you actually uh, start teaching. And I think the reason is that students ask you to do, say things in the simplest of forms and you can't hide. And I think you have to go back and say, well, how is it and why is it I'm saying what I'm saying? And I think that is a profound aspect of being able to teach. And I hope to repay, I hope I've repaid part of my debt to my teachers by trying to be a good teacher myself. But I'd also like to thank, last of all, those who opposed me uh, in academic debates or, or otherwise, or who've, um, who've had arguments with me, because you don't realize how much they make you reflect, uh, to think, uh, to uh, have a wider gaze and a, and a wiser gaze. And I think the contribution of, of opposition in life is, is seriously understated. And I think so long as one is willing to learn, this is a profound source of, of, of learning. And I've certainly benefited a great deal from that. I have to acknowledge that directly. So that's, I'd like to move now to the, to the, to the, to the main um, uh, topic. And I think you'll see both the title, and as you'll hear also from the, from the content, there's a, there's a resonance to an affinity to, to, to Gramsci um, uh, in, in the form of the uh, counter-hegemonic use of that term. Um, I don't position, I don't claim to be a, a Gramscian organic intellectual. Uh, I don't belong to that space. I cannot claim it. But I, at the same time, I would say, to be an organic uh, uh, Gramscian intellectual requires something very non-Gramscian, which is an accident of birth, that we were born into a family which was originally a working class family. So I think there has to be room for the acquisition of a counter-hegemony in your, in, your, in your argumentation, which is free of your social and your own personal origins. And I think if you see it in that manner, I, I will locate myself uh, there. I would just like to, um, I think it was um, Zhou Enlai and Khrushchev had a an encounter once where Khrushchev, in, 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 in typical style, harangued Zhou Enlai, who was, as you know, an, an elite educated Sorbonne and so on and so forth, from a very elite family. Um, and Khrushchev harangued him and said, uh, you know, there's a big difference between you and I. I'm from the working class and you're from the elite. 
And Joe and I partly said, but you know, there is something in common between us. We both betrayed our class. So, <laughs> I, and I think with that, with that note on, on Gramsci, I think, into, 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 the, into the body of the, of the argument. Now, there is no way that um, I'm going to be able to uh, convey the full depth uh, or the uh, detail of the argument I have to uh, want to put before you. It's maybe familiar to many of you. It's a series of arguments I'm trying to construct as a chain, as a story. So I'll try and uh, put the story across to you uh, with, um, with some evidence data here and there and the odd quotation, but I, I'm happy to say that um, I have actually finished this paper uh, before I'm giving the talk, and I understand that the paper is up on the website, so for those of you who have any sleeping problems, if you turn this computer on, a good sleep is guaranteed. Uh, <laughs> so where shall, I, where shall I start? I think on inequality, I, I'm really making a, a large, large argument on inequality. Uh, this is not an economist squibbling over data sets and over country samples and so on. I think you can do that forever, and it's the economist's professional, barbarian kind of a professionalism which is going on, which creates an industry of this. And in doing that industry, the wood and the trees get lost, and you don't know what it is. Why is it that you're interested in inequality? What kind of inequality and what you should be doing about this, if there's something to be done about it, apart from doing yet further studies with different data sets? <coughs> So I acknowledge the value of that scientific, uh, uh, what shall I say, stream. And from time to time, you have to dip into it to be able to pull out what actually is coming out. But I don't belong. I don't swim in that stream, and I don't wish to. I'd rather stay outside and be a consumer of those, of those things. Now, I think inequality is turbocharged politically, um, and this will become apparent. And I, I don't uh, pretend to say that I don't take a position on this. Uh, I, I do. Uh, and you will, you will see it's very clear. I can't deal with everything. Uh, I'm not going to deal with what Charles Tilley uh, has called uh, durable inequalities, which is profoundly important, which are identity-based inequalities. They would cover gender, cover age, cover race, cover religion, all these sorts of things that you can't escape, which are socially constructed and which uh, can be extremely powerful and profound. They're cross-cutting from other forms of economic inequality. I've, I'm not dealing with those in this, in this session, and you'll see that I still have something which I I, I have um, to say. The other introductory point I want to make, which is quite important, is that the, uh, you'll find that the empirical references I make are all largely to, to two countries, which are the US and to India. And in US is the most powerful and the largest, uh, the most powerful and the richest democracy um, in the world, and India is its largest. I think the argument is going to be about inequality and democracy, uh, so I think I'll t I, I, I have no uh, other excuse than to say that these are really the most important aspects, uh, uh, you know, countries in the world for, for this. I, I would like also to say that at this point in time, the, uh, the, the, behind what is happening in countries is really is, is a global process of accumulation. And in that global process, um, India, China, uh, of course, BRICS and so on, but also the advanced OECD countries, of which you can take USA and, and India and China as, as examples, are really locked in a bare embrace. It is really one equation of accumulation that we are looking at, which is emerging globally. So to take examples from this two are, are, are quite okay. Now, let's look at inequality. I, I, first, I want to be able to say something about the level of uh, inequality. And I think uh, I, I'll use Paul Samuelson. Uh, and I, very often I use examples from people who you would not expect to be speaking like that. Because if you take some leftist, you'd say, oh yes, he would say that, wouldn't he? But Paul Samuelson, and in 1948, in his classic, his first edition of his, uh, of his of economics book, he said, if we made an income pyramid out of a child's blocks, with each layer portraying $1,000 of income, the peak would be far higher than the Eiffel Tower. But almost all of us would be within one yard of the ground, 1948. In his 2001 edition, he rubbed out Eiffel Tower and he put in Mount Everest. Okay, and now I've done some calculations. I don't know what size of child block uh, his, his child had, but I, if, I use a child, if I use a child block which is two inches by two inches, and if I look at the wealth of Bill Gates, his last 66 billionth buck would reach a height of 3,300 kilometers, 373 times Mount Everest, or roughly the diameter of the moon. If you use Mitsubishi's new ultra-fast latest elevator, which reaches a record speed of 60 kilometers an hour, 
it would take Bill four days and 14 hours without a comfort stop to place his next dollar on top of his pile. So you have some sympathy for poor Bill, but it's a small price to pay for being so close to God's gate in heaven above. But at the other end, Samuelson was, was right that most people would be down there. But I can tell you that for 2009, 24.8% of American households had negative net worth. 24.8% is official data. And the amount of net worth, the ne negative net worth, was enough to put them not one yard above, but one yard below underground, which of course is the legal requirement for a New York burial. So if on the way down, if on the way down, um, Bill Gates wanted to stop for a quick cup of coffee at kilometer 122, he would encounter uh, Mukesh Ambani sitting on top of his new house, which has cost him $2 billion. If you see pictures of it, you will say, why did he ever make it? And of course, it's, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of Mbani's house. Um, but suffice it to say that what he spent on that one house was the same amount that was spent on the entire National Employment Guarantee Program in India for that year, uh, which provided 100 million days of, of work for poor people. Um, now, so that's one kind of a glimpse of it, and I think on on, on inequality, it would be right to say that the, the genie is out of the bottle and nobody's going to get, get it back in again. Um, I, I'd like to, there, there's, there's a, this is the economic inequality, but of course you experience it, you experience it in terms of human, the human, human condition. And I just want to give you one or two just quick glimpses of it. Uh, there's a very uh, extensive work by Wilkinson and Pickett, which is uh, very widely read now, which is on, on the consequences of inequality in terms of social, psychosocial, behavioral, uh, health, uh, all these sorts of uh, factors. It has also been challenged, by the way, by, by Peter Saunders, but uh, then uh, subsequently it has been restored by, by UNICEF and by uh, Isabel Ortiz and Cummings. Uh, but I want to uh, share with you data which comes from uh, demographic surveys in the US at this point in time. And what they show is something quite startling that if you were to consider um, the last the period from 1990 to 2008, and if you look at people in the US who are without school leaving degrees, and that's not a small slice of the population, by the way, you find that the longevity, absolute longevity number of years that they live has dropped by five years for women in this period of, uh, eight, this period of uh, 18 years, and for four years by, for men. Now that is absolutely staggering, and there are several surveys which have sort of shown uh, the same kind of a result, although the, num the, years, the, years, the numbers of uh, years lost vary. So it's really it's quite profound. Now, let me s s say one or two other things about the degree of inequality, the way it's rising. Um, the bottom half of the world's population owns 1% of the wealth. That's 50%. Top 1% has 40% of global assets. That's a wider study. Um, if you take inequality in the, in the core development accumulation, uh, uh, accumulation countries, it has risen for the USA. Gini, points, uh, Gini coefficient went up by three points in the USA, but it's actually an understatement. UK, three points, understatement. India, four points, serious understatement. South Africa, six points, again, a very serious understatement. The poorer the country, the more serious the understatement because the surveys don't capture the top end, and that's where the income is all concentrated. And if you take China, it's risen by 12, 12 points the Gini in a very short period of time, Russia by 22 points. And if you take the FSU countries generally between 10 and 15 points for the Gini, which is completely staggering in this period. So that's the kind of a summary which I would like to uh, give to you for this. Now, one other statistic which I think is relevant to, to, to say is that if you consider the period between 1993 and 2010, this covers the Clinton and the Bush periods, and you ask yourself, what was the total amount of incremental income in this whole entire period? and you estimate what were the shares of that incremental income which went to different percentiles of the population, then you find that the top 1% actually got 65% of that incremental income for the second half, for the Bush years. And if you were to convert that, if you use that in the last, most re recent period, you're going to find there's going to be an acceleration in this. Now, I, I don't have the time to, to go into all this, but um, an important point to take away from, from this is that at this point in time, uh, the top 1% um, of, of, um, of households uh, controls uh, something like 24% uh, 
uh, of, of, um, of wealth. And the same level, which is the highest ever since the 1920s, when it's at exactly the same, 23 point some percent. But in between, for something like 30 years, 30 to 40 years till 1976 or thereabouts, there was a big, huge decline. And these were the years which were followed the, for the, the Depression, the New Deal, uh, where there was a complete change, where the share of labor went up and the share of the bottom 90% went up, share of the top 10% came down. But from 1976 onwards, it's been reversed entirely. So there's a great U going the other way, which of course gives a complete lie to the Kuznets U curve, that it actually will decline. It had declined, but has risen again uh, in, in a phenomenal way. So that's roughly where we are. Um, if, 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 a, if a worker gets takes home one dollar, a CEO of uh, the top uh, uh, 500 companies takes home something which is uh, 380 times as much at present. And if you take the CEO and you compare him to the manager of a hedge fund, the hedge fund manager takes home on an average about one billion. Uh, the top hedge, hedge fund earnings were four billion, 3.9 billion uh, last year, which is 16 times the average of the top uh, company uh, CEOs. Now that's the, the scale which you have, about one to 4,000-ish kind of a thing for, for these groups which are going from the average working. Now remember also that in the last 20 years, um, the bottom 90% of the US population has actually experienced a decline in average income of 5%. And the further up you go along the scale, between 5 to 10%, 10, and then you go 10 to 5, and then from 5 to 1, from 1 to half, from half to 0.1, from 0.1 to 0 0.01, the further up you go, it's, it's like, a, it's like, it's, it's like uh, a tar. The, the top rates of expansion for the top 0.01% are absolutely staggering. So I think that's, that's the kind of thing to want to Now this is the phenomenon which is being, I'm referring to as plutonomy. Uh, it has been referred to as plutonomy by others, but that's the concept which I want to say to you, that we are living in an era of extreme inequalities, and these inequalities are also there in China in, and, in, and in India and elsewhere, in Brazil, of course, and in Russia. And this is a situation of, of plutonomy, which is a very specialist, uh, special situation where a very tiny minority controls the economy. Now you say, is this a moral issue? Yes, it's a moral issue. And on that basis, one sorts it out individually. But I think it's also, as far as I'm concerned, an issue which is uh, of political economy, and I'm interested in that dimension of it. Now, I'll come back to this, but you might say, well, you know, and that's one of the points I, I make here, but I'm not going to go into this. Time is too scarce to, to, to do that. Why is it that inequality has not been uh, in, the, in development discourse in quite a profound way? And I, I, I say that if you look at for development, what we do here at the Institute, what I've been doing also, it's driven by a few concepts. And those concepts, I think, are deeply flawed. Um, GNP, Shigeto Suru, that great Japanese Marxist economist, called it gross national pollution. But he called it gross national pollution you know, I don't know, 40 years ago, uh, talking about what the effect of the Japanese miracle was on, on Japanese society. Um, that reigned supreme, despite President Sarkozy's commission, including Stiglitz and, 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 and Sen. I think if you want anything for bizarre, you can't get more bizarre than that. Poverty lines, uh, I think there again, you find that um, it's, we, we've been completely obsessed with poverty lines. I've written extensively on this, and I don't want to repeat those critiques. They are there in the paper, we will see. But we've really been completely focused on this, but I have to tell you that the poverty line in India in 1973-74, when the first big exercises were done by people who had the imagination of Indian development as a social process, the Indian poverty line at that time was about 54% of average rural income. And now when the new exercise has been done, despite India getting so much richer, um, it constitutes 16% of the average rural income. So that tells you normally the idea is that as you grow richer, the poverty line rises and social norms express themselves in that way. That's what's happened in Europe, for instance, where you go to the share of a median as, as determining the poverty line. But in India, Ch and China is exactly the same. It's, it's gone down dramatically. But yet we keep focusing on this. The foster greer thorbeck method of looking at the intensity of poverty has problems of the same kind. We make such a lot of moral fuss, including the Sen index, Gini index of poverty, on the inequality amongst the poor. Oh my God, you're below the poverty line? but you're poorer than the next poorer person. Oh, therefore, the poorer you are, the more you should get. But you know, when we give money to the poor, are we giving it to the poorest within the poor? Inequality within the poor we're obsessed by. We never talk about inequality above the line. It's as if it's a different world. The foster gray topic method, which has dominated poverty measurements for an entire generation, actually says nothing. There's no, in the formula, there is no linkage at all to inequality as a whole in society. And I think it's telling you that societal inequality is out of the frame. It's just the poor which you're focusing on, and I think that's a trick. You look at that and forget about the rest. 
The same thing applies when it comes to dollar day I want to talk about because that really might just blow, uh, I have to, may have to stop a lecture. But the HDI, I want to say a word about that too. Again, it, you see it starts, poverty and HDI, I have to tell you, and participatory processes, they all start as radical concepts, uh, challenging the way things are, challenging the way things are. But then they subsequently, for instance, poverty was trying to show the green revolution wasn't working for the poor. That was the origin of the basic needs line in the ILO, going back in the 70s. But how does it happen? Then the World Bank takes it over, converts it into an absolute poverty line, draws it very low, and that's where it stays, and they delink it from the entire process of the growth process, which is actually getting people not to come off the poverty line. They actually link it to the Washington consensus and not to an alternative, which for instance, was happening in the World Employment Program, which was run by Louis Emery, of course, and this thing. So, so that, uh, that radical element disappears. If you look at the Human Development Ind Index, it's, uh, it comes from the human development approach, which comes, links up with the capability approach. But it's profoundly an individual-based approach. It has no room for inequality in it. Each individual counts, and I think that's profoundly important. But also, inequality counts. So you can't say that inequality just disappears, but it does. And if you look at the Human Development Index, you'll find that it runs in terms of enrollment rates. But enrollment rates, for instance, if you take primary enrollment rates, how, they, they are about one for almost every country. Maybe a gap of one to 1 1.5, maximum in the range. But if you look at the expenditure which is there in primary education, in a rich country, in the OECD, you say Luxembourg, something, it's about $10,000 a, a child. If you take at the other end, Congo, it's $50 a child. So an inequality, which is of that range, is compressed and made to disappear. It becomes just one to one, or literally one to 1.5, instead of being one to 200. And the same thing applies. This is not even to do with being able to complete school. And the same thing applies to, to income, where income is actually compressed in a, in a logarithmic way, such that the big gaps which are there between the average and the richest all are compressed, concertinaed, into a very narrow range. Why? Because they think, Higher levels of income should not matter, but they are mixing up the visibility of what is with what they think should be. And in so doing, the HDI actually compresses and makes inequality disappear. It's like a, the opposite of a rabbit trick. It disappears into some hat or the other, and it, it goes away. So now the uh, participation, uh, I don't want to say anything much more, but participation, again, as a concept, came up with, with Danchi. We came up with, uh, with pa Paolo Freire, which was a political participation, which is a fundamental democratic process of people demanding an understanding of themselves. It's a process of self-realization at a social level. But what, what it has been converted into is a, is a, is a donor-driven, instrumentalized uh, intervention, uh, which is designed to deliver projects, mostly, to, uh, to donors, whether they, they be governments or international donors. Uh, one student of mine, and this is where you learn from students, he said to me, sir, uh, you are right about participation. It is the way it is. But you know what we say in Bangladesh ourselves? Uh, he says that he, was, he worked for the, one of the biggest, the biggest world NGO at this point in time. He said, well, you know, we call it facipulation. We don't participate, we facipulate. I said, what is that? He says, a combination of facilitation and manipulation. <laughs> so, all right, I have uh, in, in, in this paper, which you'll see, uh, a lot of other reasons as to why inequality has not been, uh, been, been looked at, but I think part of it has been these concepts, the spectacles that we have worn, and they are those, uh, all those ideas which were in radical space have progressively gone into hegemonic space. They are, there's a stream of arguments which justify, uh, legitimize inequalities, uh, saying poverty is important. There's a lot to do with uh, the Kuznets curve, which I think I've just said to you, indicated that it does not work. I don't have the time at this stage to, to go back into this, um, in, into these uh, 15 or so positions which I've um, I looked at in, and which are there in the paper. So I think I, I'll come back to some of those um, if I do have some time subsequently. But for the time being, I think I'd like to, to, to switch here to, um, to maybe to um, a later stage of the argument because I think I've tried to establish the significance of, of inequality here already and to say that we, it's been out of the picture for, 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 uh, for good reasons. Um, most of these arguments which the constructions, uh, political constructions which are there, which legitimize inequality, I'll just give you the, 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 the names rather than the arguments. The libertarian fundamentalist argument which comes from Hayek, comes from Friedman, is well known. Uh, inequality is good but it induces charity. I think I'll, maybe I'll share a word with you on that. Uh, Professor Jigdish Bhagwati, uh, one of my, again, eminent teachers at that point in time, he said if a thousand people become millionaires, the inequality is less than if Bill Gates gets to the billion all by himself. But the thousand millionaires, with one million each, will likely buy expensive occasions, BMW houses and, and so on, and toys and all the rest of it. He says, in contrast, Gates will not be able to spend his billion, even if he were to buy a European castle a day. 
and the unconscionable wealth would likely propel him, as in fact has done, to spend the bulk of his money on social good. So that's his justification. If you really pile it up, you can justify extreme inequality, because if you do it, there'll be more money left over, actually, for, for doing this charity and so on. Now, I've actually argued here that if you see the US data, which comes on, on the database on charities, charity money is given the further down the scale you go from the top end, from that pyramid, the higher is the percentage given to charity. The higher is the percentage. The smallest percentage is given by people who actually have more than, you know, I don't know, 10 million or 5 million or whatever. You, further you come down into the normal realms of income, you find the higher the percentage is. That's one side. Of course, the other side we know very well about the question of uh, being able to, uh, are you not accountable to anybody? Uh, there's no accountability to government. Governments may not be accountable themselves very much, but certainly Bill Gates is not at all accountable. And there's a lot of worry and concern at this time about, for instance, the prioritization and designing of programs in, say, the World Health Organization, where the budget which they have is overwhelmingly dominated by, by contributions from, uh, from, from the, from the uh, Melinda and Bill Gates uh, Foundation. They also don't pay taxes, by the way, very much. Uh, then, of course, you know the argument about it being a necessity, because it's a regrettable necessity. You know, don't kill the goose that uh, kill the, and, you know, the, which lays the golden eggs and so on. And both Samuelson and Stiglitz have written very powerfully against this whole notion um, because they've said that there is really no relationship uh, scientifically between being paid those sums and any impact that you can measure or estimate in terms of the productivity of industry, that Samuelson idea, and also from the uh, impact on the economy and investments, which is to do with the financial sector in the economy. So there's no connect, there's a complete disconnect between the, the so-called incentive pay and, and, and the outcomes which, which have come in it, uh, in, in, which we know already about this. Uh, Martin Feldstein, of course, talks about uh, uh, you people are sort of, you know, just party poopers. Um, so what? He says if a bird comes and drops a million in your, in your, in your, on your lap, uh, why should you worry? Because it, it's, it's come and dropped it on your lap, it's not affecting you. So, uh, so if people get very rich, I mean, uh, so long as it's uh, not getting other people poorer, why should you worry? Now, I think that that argument actually is quite mind-boggling, which comes from the head of the research, National Bureau of Economic Research. And you can only understand why an economist of that caliber would say this if you also explore and carefully look at his role in the Enron scandals. Um, okay, there's a big argument about Hirschman and so on, but I'm not going to go into this. I, let me come now to the, to the heart of the matter. So if I say that these things are all wrong, then what's, what am I saying is important? And I want to make um, the following chain of argumentation. Firstly, I've said to you, inequality is not just inequality, it's extreme inequality. And extreme inequality I'm referring to as plutonomy. It's like a system which is running the, running the economy. That's the first, first premise in this. To support this premise, uh, again, I go to the other side. And in 2005 and 6, research teams, those bright boys from the Citibank, they were researching the nature of the global economy, and there are three leaked plutonomy memos. Incidentally, that's where the name word plutonomy came into, into use more recently. There are three different kinds of things, and they say the world is divided into pluton plutonomies and the rest. The plutonomies are UK, USA, um, and Canada, and one or two other countries, and th then there's the rest. And there's a very powerful argument that they make with regard to uh, the existence and the control of plutonomy. I'll come to this. So that's the first point I want to make about it, that it's, it's really there as a system, as a global system, uh, which is managed. Uh, the second point which follows from there, and that's I want to say, is that this kind of extreme inequality has very powerful implications uh, with regard to the global economics. Uh, typically, the global financial uh, collapse has been, has been thought of as a uh, collapse in terms of Oh, you know, regulatory failure and so on and so forth, and you know, it should have been this and, and that kind of. But you don't ask where the regulatory failure came from, and it just seems to be an oversight. Uh, Galbraith said, oh, the, you know, there'll be in the new industrial class in 1967, he said, oh, you know, corporate, uh, corporate governance will stay good because we won't collectively cheat because somebody's always looking over you and the morals are very strong and so on and so forth. Well, it didn't happen quite like that because there's a possibility of collective cheating. And the collective cheating is what has really happened in this, in, in this whole business. But it's not just a question of moral failure. What's happened, and this is now linked to uh, what um, Jagdish Prakriti has called the uh, Wall Street Treasury Complex. Um, what, is, what happens is that if you have uh, that amount of money at the top, it doesn't all go to charity, but money needs to make more money. 
and where do you make more money from when the global real economy is growing at 2-3% a year and you can't get your money to produce profits from that at any great rate. And that's where the pressure for financialization comes in and you come in with a form of financialization, more instruments of financialization, which give you the possibility of being able to capture more profits, but it is a process which is inherently unstable. And it's inherently unsustainable in the sense that it will collapse at some point in time. And I think that's the kind of a pressure which, which comes on in, on account of this, uh, uh, this, this factor of extreme uh, inequality in the distribution of, of, of income at the top. I wanted to uh, share with you the, um, something which um, the work of Ma Michael Mahavi Lim uh, at the Levy Institute was looking at the, at the, at the crash. And uh, he points out that if you look at the structure of money supplies, you have the usual M1, M2, M3, which are kind of different kind of sources of money. He says, but those actually constitute, I don't know, about 5% or something of this kind for the total stock of money-like instruments. And more than 85% or so of the money-like instruments are these derivatives, which are not controlled and not controllable by others, but these are controlled by that very tiny minority of banks and by people who actually own that wealth and on whose behalf this leveraging is being done. And this is the source which then, from this extreme inequality, puts pressure on these people to behave and to break the rules and to get the rules broken uh, because the, the scale is just too much. I would have to uh, tell you that um, um, Jagdish Bhagwati, when he's describing his, uh, his, 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 his uh, Wall Street and uh, Treasury complex, he says this, he says, we now know that the five guys, there were five guys from these investment banks, Goldman Sachs and Hank Paulson, the former Treasury Secretary, who went to Christopher Cox, the Chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, and said, we don't need any reserve requirements on derivatives, which is what makes the derivatives completely explosive, which means that, you know, you just can make them at will. This led to over-leveraging and disaster. Cox was probably intimidated by the wealth of the lobby. They represented trillions. And the Treasury was systematic, also systematically sympathetic. And the people who are there, he talks about a revolving door, the people who are the head of Treasury in the State Department, at the head of the IMF, the head of the World Bank, they all just go in and revolving situations which go right across from one investment bank to the other to the other, and they go right around one after the other. And the same applies whether you are Democrats uh, in power or whether you have the Republicans in power. And that's the idea of plutonomy, that it's not something which is shifting. Uh, the world, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the work of, of this, these plutonomy memos, they, they say that uh, plutonomy is not at risk, except politically, but they, uh, they say that the muscular arms of, of the people in China and in the US are not going to let uh, plutonomy go off its axis. So people who talk about global imbalance forget that the imbalance actually resides also in particular social groups and classes, and they have a common interest in being able to make their, their equation between themselves. And I think that's an argument which is really very, very powerful, which is made there. Now, I think there is, um, this is the other uh, side which comes up from, uh, from, from, the, from, from plutonomy. The second point about this extreme inequality which I want to emphasize, that's what you can refer to as the loss of community at one level. There is no empathy because there's no connection between the two lives. Uh, Chomsky calls it, uh, uh, it's a combination of, of the plutocrats and the precariat. They are the plutocrats, and that's what the American system is. And he says there's complete disheartening and uh, dis disenchantment in the United States, and there's a pervasive sense of hopelessness, sometimes despair, and I think it's quite new in American history, and it has an objective basis. And this is the objective basis which you have in it. Uh, it is from the historical, also from the historical process through which uh, the bottom, the great beast, has been kept relatively uneducated. Um, if you uh, look at the uh, statistics of the national uh, centers for functional learning uh, in the US, uh, they, they, they show that only about 10% of the population, 10 to 12%, are actually at the lower proficiency when it comes to literacy, document reading, prose reading, document reading, and uh, numeracy. It's about 10% or so, 90%, 89 point something, are below that level. So it's not surprising that then 18%, even in an election year, should think that Obama was a Muslim. Um, now, in terms of the argument, therefore, about the economic crisis, then brings the focus on uh, the ability of this economic power to uh, erode institutions, subvert government. And this has done very systematically with regard to uh, the US, it's very clear. Mind you, when I speak of the US in the subversion, 
many of the processes and mechanisms that we in Europe or in India uh, would regard as being illegal are actually formally constitutionally legal in the US. Uh, there were members of parliament in the UK who accepted a thousand pounds to ask a question and they were virtually kicked out of parliament and socially ostracized. But to ask a question and to be paid for it, there's a lobby industry which is competing to get uh, people in, in Congress or in the Senate. And so that's perfectly legal. Uh, likewise, for many other aspects of this kind. And con uh, now, this is subversion of government, I think, is a very powerful uh, feature of this. And I, I want to um, also highlight the role of campaign, campaign donations in this. It's, uh, it's an appropriate point of, of this time. We know that the US campaigns have cost more than $2 billion. But people may not be aware that a very substantial chunk of this has come from uh, the super wealthy, uh, from the top uh, listed kind of billionaires uh, of, of, of the country. And now you can say, oh, that's so, so, and, and they are on both sides of the line, by the way. Do you say, does that cancel out? No, not quite. When they give money out, uh, there are conditions. There are conditions. And there's a very famous ruling, very significant landmark ruling which has taken place in the American courts very recently, which says that corporations have the same rights as individuals with regard to the freedom of speech, which has meant that the corporations can fund campaigns where you can go public on individuals, you can have campaigns with posters, so long as you don't say at the bottom, please vote for somebody or the other. If that line is not there, you really have enormous freedoms being able to, to get after candidates. And so the result of that is that people are uh, being able to go through what they call the super political action committees, super PACs, and there's a whole range of other organizations which, which are controlling the funding of the American election, which are all answerable in some way or the other to this, to this uh, plutocratic kind of machine. And I give you one example of one plutocrat. Uh, this is Sheldon Edelson, who's a casino billionaire. His contributions account for slightly more than 8% of all super PAC contributions and 12.5% of all mega donor donations. A longtime conservative donor, Edelson has made clear that he would like to see from the government lower taxes on the rich and on business, especially business overseas, a hardline position on Israel, opposing a two-state solution, any recognition of Palestinian rights and heightening of tensions with Iran, and the end of potentially damaged investigation for allegedly violating, violating foreign bribery laws by one of his companies. Now, so people are asking what kind of things uh, are actually not happening. But the effect I want to point out here, people keep talking about these sorts of effects. But imagine there's a, there are candidates who are saying that when I went to talk to my colleagues to say, will you actually vote for a transaction tax on stock trades? Uh, colleagues in the Congress said, no, sorry, we won't, because you tried to do this and you got all these big shots funding campaigns against you. So if you were to do this, we'll get campaigns against us. We don't want to do it. So just the threat of a campaign is enough to actually keep people in their place. You don't even have to spend the money. So I think the, the leveraging effect with which these people are quite, uh, so I think that's the kind of a thing I'm, I'm referring to here uh, when it comes to, uh, now, if I'm criticizing other countries, I think it's entirely fair that I should have a look at my own. And I think I'm gonna say a few things here, which I say uh, as proof of uh, the freedom of speech, which attaches to Indians regardless of where they are. And uh, uh, again, Professor Bhagwati said, well, you know, in India, they, in, he's talking to parliament. He's talking to the new parliament, and he said, addressing the parliamentarians, he said, there's too much made of corruption in India. He said, even a blind man will tell you, I saw a bribe being given. <laughs> okay, Professor Bhagwati. Now, so I said, okay, let me see who are these people he was addressing who were sitting there. In the 15th Lok Sabha, 150, or 28.1 percent, had a total of 533, by the way, had a total of 412 criminal cases against them. Of these, 72 elected MPs had a total of 213 serious criminal charges, which might be attempted murder, rape, arson, looting, things of this kind. No single party was free of this. All major parties had a quarter to a third with criminal charges. Some of the largest states had the highest criminalization rates. So I said, hey, what's going on here? But then being a, you know, having taught applied statistics, I asked myself, surely this must be the case in the rest of India as well. So I had to look at the overall rates of the population as a whole. How many criminal charges are there in the country as a whole? And you can get that from the criminal records office. So I had a look. 
And it turns out that using these rates, it can be roughly estimated that the rate of criminal charge cheating for the Indian parliamentarians is more than 15 times higher than that for the Indian adult po population over 35 years of age. On this evidence, a statistician could spend an entire lifetime drawing and redrawing alternative samples of 513, 533 persons from the general Indian population and never really come up with any that could match the rate of criminalization of the elected parliamentarians. The parliamentarians certainly seem to lead by example in this regard. Now, mind you, just like the rest of the Indian population, these people are also innocent till proven guilty. But I'm not saying that the rest of the Indian population is, is innocent or guilty. I'm just comparing the rates of charging. So th there you are, there's something. Now, candidates who won had two and a half times, more, more, 2.5 times more likely to win than clean candidates. Assets, those who have more assets, more likely to win. I won't bore you with the details. And so it goes on, yeah? And now I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite a, uh, remarkable that a person like Jagdish Prakriti should address this bunch of, this very special sample of Indian population and, and be able to say that only a blind man will say that there's corruption in the country. I think it's remarkable and I, only, I can only say that this reflects the, that he's a very loving and affectionate sort of a person and it's his deep loyalty and love of Dr. Manmohan Singh, his old dear friend, that has made him say this. Uh, but also because he's so fond of the reforms that he, he, you know, he thought that, you know, come on, he's having a bad time, give the man a break. So I, what are the judiciary, the other arm of the, of the, of the um, of, of democracy? I just want to, I can't go on and on about this, but all this stuff is there in the, in the paper which I give. Uh, there's an ex-union law minister who has actually sent an affidavit to the Supreme Court, Judge, Chief Justice India, saying that eight of the last 15 Chief Justices of India were corrupt. And he has provided evidence, he says, to the Chief Justice. And he says, please go public or charge me with perjury or do something with the other. I think this is maybe an exaggeration, maybe a political something, yes, yeah, possible. But anyway, it is. But the Chief Justice himself has recently, and all the time this is going on, has transferred 20 High Court judges and Chief Justice of the High Court from one place to another. In India, we don't fire people because firing is almost impossible. If you're found corrupt somewhere, you say, please go and practice your corruption somewhere else. We transfer you. <laughs> so you transfer. So you go and have your, uh, you know, your good fund somewhere else. So they've been doing this. I'll give you another example of this, which is mentioned and highlighted. If you cannot practice in a court, if the judge is related to you in any way, and, 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 and you know, uh, Rule 6 of the Bar Council uh, regulations actually specifies what exactly those relationships are, and they're very extensive. You know, uncles, is that right? You know, but in India, they are, of a total of 499, there are 131 uncle judges. And this list in 21 high courts, and this list was sent by the Bar Council of India to the Union Law Minister years ago. Nothing is done about it. And this, the business carries on. The Chief Minister of West Bengal said in the, on, on, in the, uh, on the floor of the assembly that you can actually buy uh, judicial judgments. Uh, she might also be in political. Um, and also at the same time, you can, um, there's the, one of the socially minded Chief Justices, not Chief Justice, but a, a bench of the Supreme Court. Uh, he said, of one of the oldest uh, high courts in the country, the Yellowbath High Court, he said, it needs some house cleaning. He said, there is something rotten in the state of Denmark said Shakespeare in Hamlet. And it can be similarly said there is something rotten in the Yalabad High Court. And he says, the judges went on, we are sorry to say, but a lot of complaints are coming in of kith and kin practicing the same court. And within a few years of starting practice, the sons in relation to these judges become multimillionaires, have huge bank balances, luxury cars, huge houses, and enjoy luxurious life. I will say no more on, on this. Let me then look at the executive. And here, if you go down, I invite you to have a look at Wikipedia. That, um, scoundrel website, isn't it? Um, and just go down and say scams. Or look at any Indian newspaper and see scams in India. And I think it's interesting, because you can sort of just carry on this, this, this scam, that scam, this, and it goes on and on. And I just want to mention one here. It's uh, this so-called, over this, this called the 2G scam. It's, it's really made the, it's been the biggest one there is around for a, for a bit, but it's still, it's been overtaken, by the way. And the amount, it's, it's not auctioning at a rate which is too low to people that you like of, uh, of rights to, 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 um, to broadband. And the amount of money which the Treasury is supposed to have lost or what they could have got from the auction that didn't get is an amount of 34 billion, 
according to the Controller General of Auditor General of India. If you look at the adapted parameters which come out from a Supreme Court ruling on this, it would be about 15 to 20 percent less. That's what, where it would it, it land up. If I put this together, what's the scale of it? This amount is 8.5 times the national allocation for the entire National Rural Health Mission. If you put the entire payment for the entire Rural Employment Guarantee Program from its inception to this year, that's what this amount is. If you get the entire rural population of India, which is below the poverty line, the entire population, and you say, what is your consumption? 85% of that consumption would amount to this sort of a sum. We are looking at staggering sums which are being talked about here. Now, the point I want to make here, and this also goes back to the US point, and this is my more general point I want to draw from it. I'm not making a moral argument here. I'm not making a moral argument. I, I think these, these are out of, out of sync, all these numbers. They are, they are crazy. But the point to realize is that this is some form, uh, historically, if you step back and you look at it, and if you were to see this now from 50 years down the line, you'd find that these features resemble an accelerated process of capitalist development in its, in, its, uh, in its breakthrough phase. It's another breakthrough phase we're looking at. And in those breakthrough phases, the rules that you have, the rules of the game, relations of production, which includes governance and many other things, actually hold these people back. And so these guys actually break those rules. So you're getting a process here, which is a primary capital accumulation of the highest variety. And there are two forms of primary capital accumulation here, both from the former form Soviet Union, which is the privatization of previously socialized assets, and from also in countries like India, where you're looking at land and you're looking at forests, you're looking at water, which belongs to uh, communities and uh, people who are there, but also looking at the privatization of, of, of socially owned assets. But you're look, looking at a process in which this is a new model of accumulation. This is a new model of accumulation. And this model of accumulation is then controlled in the same way that I apply implied for the US by people who actually have a purchase on government. And government, I'm sorry to say, uh, as I've given you these examples, are, are, they are populated by ordinary civil servants who join the service to actually do a, a professional life, but actually are confronted by a system which is highly uh, hegemonized and is controlled in a pyramid. And the controls they actually respond to political uh, manipulation at the top. And so willy-nilly, you could be a wonderful person, you could be absolutely dead right and straight down the barrel, but you're part of a system which is being manipulated in some form at key points in the chain, which actually make it deliver this form of accumulation to that elite class, the plutocrats of the country, which then call it accumulation. Growth rates go up, but nothing happens further down the line. And this is now the um, accumulation model, which I'm, uh, I'm trying to say is, 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 is a problem. Uh, what about the whistleblowers on this? The press. Well, that's my last thing on it, the false estate. The press has, well, in India, newspapers for sale, but regrettably also the news for sale. This is uh, a new feature which has come up in a big way. Uh, and I only know it because I read the press. And you, uh, so what we get from the press is that uh, you can place advertisements which don't look like advertisements. You can, uh, in campaigns, uh, pay money to actually get the other person um, beaten down and for, for you to be told that you're brilliant and all this. And this is, um, is quite remarkable. So they, recently, since 2009, there's a phenomenon of paid news. Uh, and it's entering all forms of, uh, of newspapers right across the board. I'm quoting here from a report which has been uh, provided by the Press Council of India. So it's not uh, done by uh, two uh, NGOs which are activists, something or the other. The Press Council of India, which has actually done this report, is on the website, and you can have a look at this. And now they say the entire process operation in the elections is, is, is clandestine. They say it's, it's becoming more and more widespread. They say marketing executives use the services of journalists, willingly or otherwise, to gain access to political personalities. So-called rate cards or packages are distributed that often include rates for publication of news items that, are not merely praise, that not merely praise particular candidates, but also criticize their political opponents. Candidates who do not go along with such extortionist practices on the part of the media organizations are denied coverage. Now, is it very different from the Murdochization of the press in another form in the UK or the Murdochization in the US? It's taking a different form. Uh, in India, but the pressures and the outcome and the process, the essence of the process you're looking at is essentially similar. It's a complete erosion and subversion of a pillar of, of democracy uh, by people who actually have the money and the power to do so. And it's serving a small group which has that capacity. And it's the same thing which, as I said to you, applies to the judiciary, to the executive, and also to these parliamentarians. 
There are also private treaties where big money houses place advertisements. And when they place advertisements, that's what the newspapers run for. The BCCL, Bennett Coleman Company uh, of India, which runs major titles, when you look at the editors, and their two brothers, uh, the one who actually calls the shots is the chap who runs the advertisements. He says, I'm not interested in the news. This newspaper is about ads. That's where you get our money from. And the ads are to do with not tangling with any major company which is providing those ads, which are all the major, major um, uh, corporates. So you don't then, uh, here's the problem where with the editorial and the, uh, the money side of it actually come into conflict. And I think, apart from this, is the concentration of media ownership. Uh, yeah? I mean, I'm not here referring to the social effect of um, an acceleration of the attention disorder deficits on the Indian population as they watch television uh, or they look at magazines these days, because that's uh, an effect which I think will only show up in the course of the next generation when they grow up and they can't write and add and uh, produce any logic together. So where are we on this? And I want to um, now come to the close of uh, my, my argumentation. I, perhaps one point I should uh, mention to you, the Forbes magazine produces a list of billionaires. You must be familiar, the rich of the world. I did a small exercise. I said, let me take the wealth of the richest, of the billionaires of India, China, US, Netherlands, and ask, how significant is this wealth? If I looked at 1992, sorry, I beg your pardon, 2002, I found that the wealth in India of these billionaires, the only five, was 2.8% of the Indian GDP at that point in time. Remember, wealth is a stock, GDP is a flow. I'm just giving you an idea of the wealth which can be brought to bear on, in relation to this, it's some kind of a normalization. 2.8%. It was the same for China, one billionaire at that point in time. But 13 if you included Hong Kong. If you take 2010, you find that the number of billionaires in India, 47. In China, 89. They've gone from 1 to 60 in mainland China. But more interestingly, if you look at the proportion, if you look at the ratio of wealth to GDP, for China, it has gone from 2.8 to 5. A lot of hidden wealth still. And the Indian side has gone from 2.8 to 12. Gone to 12. A different source gives you ultra high net worth individuals who have wealth worth a net worth of 30 million or, or, or more. This is much less than the Forbes uh, threshold. 8,200 Indians on the list. If you add up their wealth and you say, how is that compared to the GDP for that year, which is 2009? 55% of Indian GDP. India is not a small economy. If you take away agriculture, this would be something like you're looking at something like 60, two thirds of the Indian economy. This is the clout which responds to the notion of plutonomy and plutocracy that I'm talking about. We're not talking just about uh, you know, small change. These are really very powerful uh, groups that we have in mind. So where do we go from here with this? Uh, and I uh, would like to uh, close with a reflection on, on, um, on generally. So my, I, I want to um, maybe cite from Adam Smith. I'm not going to quote things to you. It's not no time for that. <coughs> Adam Smith's more important work was not the wealth of nations. It was the theory of moral sentiments. That's where his heart and soul is. All this Glasgow and all this school and all the rest of it, these, all these people who claim paternity from uh, Adam Smith, they would all fail their DNA tests, by the way. But they claim that paternity. It suits them. But if you were to look at, um, if you were to look at Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, it's really quite, quite profound. And from there, I extract three characterizations of society that he has. One is a society of affection, community, people get along, know each other, help each other, network. The second is a society of anomy, people don't know each other. These are words I'm using, he doesn't use the same. Anomy where they don't know each other, anonymity, but still it works together as a commercial organization. Now this is the part which is the wealth of nations, written um, 17 years later, or even more than that, uh, yeah, 17 years later, 1759, 1776. So the third one, he says, is, an, is a society of aggravation, of conflict. Uh, where people do a dissonance, where society is scattered, where it's broken up. Uh, and I, I ask you, uh, which, is, which of those three uh, current day societies actually uh, seem to correspond to? 
Yeah? But we live by the rule book of the wealth of nations, expecting the results which should be either in the wealth of nations or even in the economies of affection. But actually, the reality that I'm describing to you has, bears no, has no, no linkage with the wealth of nations. And even if you read wealth of nations carefully, it doesn't say the kind of things which are actually ascribed to it. So this other Adam Smith, I think, is well worth looking at to see where we are in that, in that large game. And I would like also to say that this, in, this, this, this plutocracy that I'm talking about in place of democracy, and, and plutocracy, as I said to you, is the, uh, the system which comes out when plutonomy operates on democracy and subverts it. You get sort of plutocracy. It has a very low center of gravity. Um, and say in the US, both parties subscribe to the same system of plutocracy. If you have billionaires on one side, you have them on the other side. If you see the sources of wealth of the US in terms of who are the people from the Democrat side, the billionaires and the Democrats, the billionaires and the, you might get ranch, you know, different oil and ranches on one side, but you will get internet and you know, the new kinds of, of wealth coming in on the Democratic side. But at the end of the day, you're really looking at people who are, have still the same material interests which are, which are combining. And they combine, as I said to you, in the Wall Street complex, where they all, uh, whether you looked at the Wall Street complex it, uh, and the Treasury complex is the same. Whether it's, it's, it's a Clinton period or a Bush period or any other period is the same. It has resonance also, uh, I should say, to what in 1961 um, Eisenhower uh, said in his uh, farewell address, um, which reminds me that I should also be stopping, um, that he, uh, he says that he refers to the military industrial complex. And uh, he says that this is the threat and the danger to American democracy. And that's coming from a person who's a military man. And when, and he was, a, he was the president of Columbia, and uh, the other person who wrote about this complex before him, of course, was, um, sorry, uh, yeah, before him was, was uh, C. Wright Mills uh, in his power elite. And in the power elite, he actually refers to a militarization and the culture of militarization and securitization as being one of the elements, that's one of the three elements in it. And so I think Eisenhower is actually a pretty good example of that whole notion of, 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 of this. I think he's pointing out that this is where the dangers would come from. If you go further back into American writing on American democracy, the Tocqueville says exactly the same. He says if there are dangers to American democracy, it'll come, the new aristocracy, it'll come from the corporates. And uh, they'll come through that door. And that's what's happening. Is there a way back? Is there a way back? Um, and I, 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 I don't... Uh, want to be able to say that there is a way back or not. I think uh, this, these things go in cycles. Uh, these things are, are, are struggles. There is the whole business about Tina. Um, uh, there is no alternative. Uh, but I want Tina to meet Alex. Um, Alex's alternatives exist. Uh, so and I think uh, alternatives do exist. The only trouble is that all the alternatives that we have on the side of economics, on the side of politics, uh, at a micro or a local level, they all seem to flounder at the last test of, of, of pol political realism. Because the machine, as I said to you, with this, with this control over the system is so strong that the process has to be much broader. But when you have such a division as a 1% or a 0.1% as against the rest, as I said to you, 90% are actually had a deterioration of the income standards for 30 years, I think then there's a chance that maybe you would say it will express itself somewhere. And that expression shows up in, in for instance, in the, in the elections. But the elections are already, uh, the possibilities of elections are already contained uh, by that whole system that I described to you. So you might say the top 2% will pay taxes, but, but I'm not sure that so far they've not paid any taxes, hardly any taxes at all. And just by saying you'll pay taxes doesn't mean that they won't have legal ways of, of still not paying them. Uh, there's nothing happened which is uh, controlling the, well, the, the structure of, of finance making, financial instrument making, which is significant. And so I think the same pressures apply that, that applied earlier on this. So I think that's the uh, kind of an idea which I want to say. Now, finally, on inequality, as I said to you, there is now, first nobody was talking about it in general discourse. In Europe, it's not surprising because it's not, not that high. By the way, in the Netherlands, your six billionaires only add up to 0.2% of your GDP, so you're okay. Uh, they, if you ask why, all of a sudden you find that that great paragon of morality, Dominique Strauss-Kahn, has made a lot of statements where he's also cited and quoted from Adam Smith on morality and social morality and things like this, and referred to the importance of inequality. Oh, that's interesting. A research study from the world, from the IMF says, the reason why we've had this crisis is extreme inequality. The 5% of the investors are controlling the 95% of the workers whose bargaining power has gone down. They're talking like Kaletsky. 
This is from the IMF Research Department. If you look at the OECD, they have a report, and the year before last, which is talking about inequality, divided we stand. It's a very big report and very uh, important. If you look at the MDG report, MDGs which have seriously criticized, I think on sound grounds, from years, you know, seven years ago, on the absence of inequality as being the key, where's the elephant you know, in, in the room is not. Uh, now all of a sudden, Sakiko uh, Fakuda Par is, uh, can't go to bed without having, having to say something about inequality every day. I mean, it's uh, MDGs and inequality, whether Jan van de Motel, but these are the people who actually fashioned the whole thing. All of a sudden, inequality is right up there. Uh, I think the ILO had been talking about inequality, and I see that Rolf was actually was one of the earlier workers on this, but the talk about inequality has actually disappeared into the porridge of, of decent work. And you can't, it doesn't come up, except as an irritant when you, when you eat it. So I think all this inequality talk coming back, and recently, in the same room, standing here, we had uh, our new uh, honorary fellow, uh, Robert Chambers, who parts of his work I, I, I like and admire, saying that, oh, inequality, uh, but where was you all these years? Because the approach of participation, the facipulation approach that they've had, has had zilch, zero to say about inequality. So it worries me, all of a sudden, all these people who never had a thought about inequality suddenly line up, line up and saying inequality, inequality. So this worries me because I think um, we are at a stage in the cycle of ideas, in the life cycle of ideas, where the radical stage is actually made an argument, like Gandhi said, um, First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. And I think we are at a point where they've ignored you, they've laughed at you, and now they've been trying to fight you, and they can't quite fight it, and now they're trying somehow to win. But in that win, they are realigning and reinventing the whole framework of poverty and themselves. And I think this is a kind of, kind of a, I see it as a counter, as a hegemonic exercise of reinvention. And to my mind, the, it's important at this stage to bring up the issue of, of extreme inequality and what it means. And the, what it means really is not instrumental things about, oh, it leads to bad health and bad education. It does, but those are more manifestations of inequality at a lower level. But I think the key thing is that extreme inequality, which the system of accumulation is actually generated, this globalization, is something which captures and holds uh, democracy. It has held democracy to fortune. It's literally, it's a hostage to fortune. That's what democracy is at this point in time. So this light to plutocracy is what I think is a citizen's uh, call. And typically, it, would, uh, it is the citizens within the framework of, of a Gramscian framework that would respond to it. And there's a role in that framework for an organic or a counter-hegemonic voice from academia. And that is what, as I go out, I've tried to, to voice. Uh, and so thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Said, for your wise words on inequality. They should be an inspiration to us all. I would like to invite Dr. Bridget O'Loughlin for the Laudatio. Thank you, Ashwani. It's a bit difficult, I think, to uh, give a Laudatio uh, for a valedictory because you're recognizing a space of sadness. You're telling everyone who's going to miss somebody how wonderful the person who's leaving is. Um, it's a contradiction, really, isn't it? So that's what I'm going to try to do. And what I'd like to talk about is the space that Ashwani Seth leaves. Uh, at the ISS in London, I guess, too, and but much more generally in development studies. And I want to ask, why is that space so big? Uh, what, what's behind it? Now, it's fairly easy to say, look, he's an extraordinary person, more or less sui generis. Who would ever find another one? And indeed, are we sure we want one, right? That's uh, also <laughs> a question. Um, and there are many personal things that I can say. Look at the breadth of education and interest 
that he has. History, art, music, things that span continents, countries, places, times. He's an economist, a really good one, but he's all those other things besides. It's extraordinary, the breadth of education that he has, and rather mind-boggling when, for example, we're in a DNC meeting, an editorial board meeting, and you get the range of references. His recall is wonderful, probably a mixed blessing for him in some ways. Yeah? The second thing about him is this extraordinary mastery of words, whether spoken or written in conversation, in lectures, in written papers. There can be a quip, an aphorism, um, but also a wonderful explanation of something that's inherently difficult, hard to follow. And he loves them. You can, you can feel him loving the words as he uses them. The next thing is, um, I think, his critical, fast, acute intelligence, capacity of response. Um, it's a kind of distance, a capacity to see things, but then also to come back quickly with it. Frankly, it's a bit frightening. I've been in seminars where I sort of sat on the edge of my chair for somebody else, not even worried for myself. Yeah. Um, what's he going to say? And do you know, uh, yes, will the person be able to take it? Um, extraordinary. I should also say that as a result of this time on development and change, I can see that he can be quite diplomatic, um, elegant, and rather charming, surprisingly from my point of view. <laughs> <and so. laughs> Though he can also be prickly. Huh? Um, uh, that's also true. Now, all of these things are amazing, but after all, they can't be reproduced. Ashwani is Ashwani. And if that's what the ISS is losing, there's no um, hope, yeah? We, you can't do very much about that. But um, what I want to argue is that actually, the way Ashwani has filled this space here at the ISS, and also more broadly in development studies, has to do with a distinctive vision that he has about what development studies is. And I think that that the ISS can think about, can use, can, you know, not perhaps uh, reproduce with a single person, but can think about the implications of it for what um, is done here in development studies. So to look at that, I went back to the um, laudatio that um, he gave um, and it was an important one. It was for Edouard uh, Said. Yeah? And he represented what um, we were at that time, what the ISS was, to Said. He explained what development studies means. And he said that development is a cluster of processes driven by human agency, unfolding and claiming liberation and emancipations in material, social, cultural, and political domains. This seemed to me, then and now, a powerful definition of development studies, which allows us to get past the ambiguities of post-colonial projects. Um, there are these, you know, 
Scylla and Charybdis that I think of in my own history, including here, um, there's the image of development studies as a project for people who cl come from developing countries who have a lot of experience of work, but not such great education, and um, in which through exchange of experiences, people come to learn more than what they began with. There's something to that, of course, but it's a very reduced account of what education means. And ultimately, I think it's paternalist. It can result in a definition of multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity, which is based on the least common denominator. The Charybdis, that was Scylla, the Charybdis is another kind of technical project, very often more discipline based, in which we teach the other how to do it better. So this can be in the period of planning, how to do planning, it can be how to construct poverty indices, it can be things that we teach that people don't know. In Ashwani's formulation, we're asking a set of questions that do not disappear. Questions about liberation and emancipation are not restricted to one place in the world or to one period. And if they are interdisciplinary, it's because their answers have to be interdisciplinary. And that seems to me to be an important way to think about development in this period of general change and reorganization, and something that it's worth the ISS considering um, in rereading Ashwani's work and thinking about um, what he has said and will say. I think that uh, this particular vision has guided a lot of what he has done in his um, academic life. Uh, first off, his teaching is a very uh, broad process. His conception of teaching is of a very broad process. Uh, in the first sense, lectures. Uh, because of the universalizing social security course, I actually sat in on Ashwani's uh, lectures. And it was a tremendously interesting experience because he would circle around like this, never with PowerPoints, and never limited to references only to the things that were on the reading list. Yeah? I would sit there and think, are the students going to bear this? I mean, you know, is, are, are, are they going to really stick with this? What was interesting was that it was like attending a good film. You get caught, and you're forced to put effort in and you learn as you go. And of course there are some students who don't make it, but it brings in many who would never thought of trying, engages them intellectually. I, I found it uh, a wonderful experience to watch. The second thing is that the um, seminar series, and I will still take as the prototype the Rural Development Seminar, as it was when I came, are considered part of the learning experience. And these seminars were seminars where um, Ashwani, among others, used their networks to bring in really great people from the ISS, from the Netherlands, and from outside the Netherlands. The standard was enormously high. People expected to be demanded to do good presentations, and they expected sharp questioning, and they got it. You would learn a tremendous amount from the discussions in those seminars. I, I particularly like, by the way, that um, the rooms were arranged so that you saw each other. Um, maybe there are limitations to scale in such exercises. But that was something from which staff and students learned together tremendously. I thought important as part 
of an educational process. Um, I, of course, think that the PhD program, to which many of you here, uh, uh, not me, but many of you, contributed in terms of developing the program, also was a resource which served both for the MA students, also for the staff, and for students themselves. Um, and Ashwani brought to his supervisions, again, a very broad range of references that allowed him to supervise topics that were not in, within his narrow field of expertise, and in fact to write on them and work on them later. The second thing um, that I think I'd like to mention is the quality of his academic writing and work. And there are two aspects to this. One are his own publications, which are um, always work that I can go back to, um, <coughs> read again. Those from the 80s, of course, this is special interest, but um, where he looked at and got together collections on the agrarian question under socialist transition. Oh, who else would do that? Yeah, uh, it was pretty wonderful stuff. Um, so there's a corpus of work for us to read. But the part you might not all see is the work that he's done with development and change. Um, Martin was alone until 1985, right? 1992, Ben came on. And that collective that set up a way of working in development and change produced a wonderful shared editorial process, which has to be one of the greatest intellectual experiences I've ever had, um, and which I think is reflected, now there I have to be careful because after all, but I think it's reflected in the quality of DNC and its presence within development studies. And finally, I'd like to say, Ashwani puts a lot of emphasis on being a public intellectual which I think is appropriate given that view of development studies. He um, would give many talks here when students came up with current topics that they would like somebody to talk about. But he also gives talks in other places, in India, writes in public media, and has paid a lot of attention to responding to organizations within the UN system that he regards as being emancipatory in focus. And that work has also stayed with us, and very often, um, actually, not just with the web, but before, has been turned into academic production. I don't expect these things to end. Um, there, I'm sorry, Reka. <laughs> I think that probably we do have a mellowing, um, and some things will fall away, but a person who's committed to understanding processes of liberation and an emancipation in our world is a person who's never at ease, and I expect um, many parts of your professional, academic, and public life to continue. Ashwani. Thanks. The lecture tells me I have to, have to there's a vote of thanks. Um, obviously, I forgot to thank people. I, first of all, uh, thanks to Bridget uh, for doing me this honor. Um, words from peers are especially important. And um, I think I, I've been the beneficiary I think if I were to say how much I've actually managed to capture, I've been part of that 0.01% in terms of how much I've got from, from the other others. So thank you, Bridget. I, um, 
I think uh, the list of people to thank is generally, of course, uh, endless. I, you, I can't go into the history of my life, but I think uh, it's now been uh, 31 years since I was at the Institute, and um, I have seen through maybe seven directors. Uh, and I'm, I must say that from the starting point of, uh, of ISS, when I came and Louis Emery was the lecturer, I recall meeting him and saying, what is it that you expect of me? He said, Ashwini, you carry on doing your research. You do the ideas part, leave the money part to me. And I think that that's a kind of form. Of course, later on, times changed. So it's not as if you, know, you had budget constraints, you had real constraints. But I've had the most uh, wonderful support from the ISS all the way through. Uh, support doesn't mean always agreements, but support means an institutional framework where you actually have a framework of being able to contribute. All I can say is that if you didn't have the sort of support that, uh, that the Institute provided, there was no way that could induce and have uh, induced the kind of effort, personal effort, which goes into agreeing to doing management jobs, for instance. Why would you want to do a management job in a place which you didn't care about? Or, so I think there's a relationship there between the uh, economy of affection that, uh, that the Institute uh, was and I hope remains, uh, and the kind of efforts that it has induced from so many of us to say, okay, this and so on. And there, of course, you can agree and disagree, but it's, uh, it's always uh, something which I, re I recall that I've headed all kinds of committees and this and that, but they've all been situations of positions of trust. So I, I thank everyone uh, in that situation. I don't think I've always uh, performed to the, to, I, I'm not much of a manager. Um, uh, not much of a timekeeper, as you can see. I, I can't uh, manage agendas, so B and C I can manage, but I think I better stop there. But I would like to thank uh, others who've all contributed to, to, uh, to my uh, bringing, above all my teachers. Um, and I think I, uh, the teachers are so many in the go across. And there are many teachers who would have the most beautiful exposition, like Amit Bhadri, the best teacher I've ever had. And there were other teachers like Balbir Singh who would always leave sentences half finished. And you said, what was the other half of the sentence? And that's how you learned. You went off thinking, you would say the Industrial Revolution in England, and uh, it was white revolution, turnips, turnips. And you said, my God, turnips and Industrial Revolution. It had to do with animal health, you discovered. So I think you, had, you have to remember all your teachers. And one of my great teachers was, of course, the uncle of our current ambassador to the Netherlands, Dr. S. Ganguly, Pankujda, as you call him. And he was, uh, he aroused curiosity, full of anger at things around. Why isn't India functioning differently? And so on. So I think there are teachers who inspire you into thinking. And I, I can't, uh, this is a time to, to say thanks. And as I said to you, people who oppose don't realize, and it's not their intention, and neither is it a, a realization that you have yourself when you are in opposition, that it's actually a profound learning experience and it actually opens you up. So I thank everyone who's also stood in the corridor and argued and disagreed. Uh, in terms of their contribution to myself, and of course my dear colleagues, uh, there's uh, and there are, I treat everybody. You know, you know who are the, the institute. I never believed in staff group boundaries. I think those boundaries are dysfunctional. They segment people. They are they lobotomize things. I always went across them, and I can't tell you how much I've learned from my colleagues, not from my own staff group, which was wonderful, but from people in staff groups which are on the other, other sides of the line, whom you otherwise would not would not meet. So I think uh, that uh, I can thank peers, I can thank teachers, I can thank students. And I think um, I, I really have stopped. Somebody said to me, oh, you know, what do you do now? And, I, and I, I play a lot of cricket, or did. And I said, oh, maybe a second innings you know, starts now. And then I heard Rekha saying to me, uh, no, no, don't make it a second innings. Make it a different game. So I think that's what I would like to stop on. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, Professor Sait and Dr. Vazir will receive you in the atrium on the first floor. So you are kindly requested to follow the academic procession. And I urge you, when we are upstairs, not to form a queue to offer your goodbye to Professor Sait, but just take a drink, enjoy the reception, and wait for a good moment to talk to him. Thank you very much. This
They are joining the meeting. Would you take? Would you take your word? Yes. Mm -hmm. Bridget.